Welcome to CWSI's industry panel discussion on enterprise mobility strategy for digital transformation. Our host CWSI are a Dublin headquartered mobility consultancy, offering many services, professional services, and training to many respected organizations across a wide range of industry and public sectors. Their mission is to transform business through mobility. This webinar is being recorded, and you can enter any question you have into the chat room to go to webinar side panel, and my colleague Abby and Jonathan will pick those up. So first, some introductions. I am Mike Wilson. I'm CEO and founder of Ditto, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Some notes on Ditto. Founded in 2008, we are a marketing and business development practice focused on technology, both offices in London and in Dublin. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Karen McCaffrey, Director of Customer Success at CWSI, Brian Farrelly, Head of Technology Partner Management at AIB, and Maureen Spare, Director of US Consultancy Services Sales and Delivery for the Wealth and Asset Management Sector at International Consultancy Firm, JDX. Hello, folks. Good afternoon. How are we all doing? Okay. Very good, Mike. Very well, thank you. Super. Well, thank you very much for joining me. I told, listen, to kick things off, let me give some words of introduction on each of our panel members. So, Karen. Karen has over 20 years' experience in enterprise sales and retention. Karen is the head of sales for of Ireland uh, for CWSI, and she also runs the customer success team to determine the appropriate tools to drive insights, actions, and value for their clients, particularly in the financial space. Brian Farrelly is currently head of technology partner management at AIB Bank in Dublin. AIB has an extensive partner ecosystem following a large outsourcing and offshoring program over recent years. Also in 2019, the European Banking Authority issued new guidelines putting a greater onus on controls required for managing third parties. All aspects of third party management are managed and coordinated through the team. The focus in 2020 is on driving technology transformation with their partners in AIB across infrastructure, application development, cybersecurity, digital workplace, and mobility. And joining on the line all the way from New York City, or actually all the way from Boston today, is Maureen doyle Spare, a director at JDS Consulting, and with 20 plus years experience in leading consulting and solution in the capital markets, Maureen leads the US consulting services and delivery for the wealth management sector for, um, for JDX. So good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be moderating today and thank you for taking part in today's discussion and sharing your insights. Right, okay, so let me begin. Let me just explain how the webinar is going to work for our audience. So to start, I will give a short overview on the topic. Uh, the panels will then give their insights into the power of mobile and business. Um, we'll have a couple of questions and we'll do around the panel uh, chat through those. There'll be time at the end for some audience questions, but please do send them in now. We get some in real time. We'll have chat as they come up. I will then sum up with one closing comment each. Great. So a short overview of the topic. So I, I guess really for all of us, we're also used to mobile phones and mobile devices. You know, how many of your employees already use a mobile device, device to, to, to get our work done? What role do mobile devices play in your digital transformation? And is mobile tech a part of your recruitment and retention strategy? And how will you manage the increased security risk of a dispersed, globally connected workforce? Firms spend a great deal of time and money figuring out the most effective route to business and digital transformation. But sometimes they overlook the most powerful tool available, one that's right in the palm of their employees' hands, their smartphones. So we'll explore how firms are harnessing the power of mobile for the businesses and learn how you can do the same for yours. And I think in this kind of coronavirus world we're living in, it's great we're all connected digitally, our audience are connected digitally, and it really brought the kind of front and center, actually having a strategy in place to react to situations and have a, a kind of mobile first workforce, I think brought that not just front of, of mind, but maybe maybe like front of newspaper. Right, so to set the scene, I, I'm gonna have, kick off with question one. So what is, and um, uh, your question once you be on your screens is there, what is enterprise mobility? Why is it an important driver of digital transformation? What role does mobility strategy play in the modern workforce? And I think, Brian, I think we'll start with you in terms of AIB. When you were sitting out sketching out the digital transformation program for the firm, figuring about the partners, there's quite a bit to dig into here. So, so first of all, why was enterprise mobility such an important part of digital transformation and what role does that play in your workforce and thinking about putting the strategy in place for AIB? Um, hi Mike, thanks very much. Thank, thank you and thank you to CWSI for the opportunity here to contribute to the discussion today. Um, 
I suppose I, I, I bring a sort of a business perspective more than a technical perspective. So if there's sort of technical questions at the end that people want, I can connect people to the, to the right people if there are, if there are, uh, are questions to be answered. But Mike, your question is, a, it's a very big question. It's a very broad question. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably take, just take a couple of minutes to answer it. And I think before we kind of define what an enterprise mobility strategy I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sense of the things that are on our agenda, because I think, interestingly, they all very much play into a mobility and enterprise mobility strategy in a holistic sense. And I just think it's probably gives a little bit of context. So one of the things, these are a number, it's not a non-exhaustive list, but a few things that are on top of mind for us is how do we balance control and agility? So hmm. where we have a, we're heavily regulated. And particularly in the context of a, of a mobility uh, workforce and a mobile workforce, how much do you tighten that down when really you want to be agile and there's a balance to be struck there? Second thing is, how do we make sure we have a sustainable flow of talent? Um, and, and that's a very much a global question about people in many different places, many of whom don't even work for us. And again, that plays back into a mobility strategy. How do we have a flexible and engaged workforce? Again, is a mobile question. How do we develop a learning culture? Um, how do we build our ecosystem of interconnected companies? Um, how do we build a quality culture in, from design to architecture? How do we collaborate across our silos? Uh, how do we introduce new ways of working, a new culture of collaboration? Now, the reason I just sort of lay those questions out, I would say those questions are very familiar to all the people listening, listening here today. But what they do is they kind of set the context in which we then start to think about um, an enterprise mobility strategy. And, I, and when I say that, I mean all aspects of it. Um, how do you enable the people with tooling processes, the different technologies, the different uh, uh, end user devices that, that, we, uh, that we, um, we rely on? The question you've asked is around digital transformation and modern workplace. What we've seen in terms of digital transformation is it is really comes down to having nimble, engaged teams. It, it was a case in the past where digital transformation was this big, you know, big production, multi, multi years, multiple streams, you know, heavy, heavy duty. But digital transformation now is a nimble thing. It's about empowering people with the right technology and devices so that they can kind of self organize. Uh, as I heard a Gartner analyst call it, it's more about delivering five goldfish a day than delivering an elephant every five years. So it has to be more nimble and mobile. The other thing you mentioned is around the, the modern workforce and how does this mobility play into the modern workforce? I think we've all seen that um, people are very, uh, not just millennials, but everybody is very expectant and demanding of the tooling and the capability that you put in their hands and also the flexibility that you give them to be to be able to do their work from many different locations uh, in many different ways in many different configurations in in different sort of teams so if you take our situation over 75 percent of our workforce is external to the bank uh, so we're heavily reliant on onshore nearshore offshore and people in in many different ways all of that plays into our mobility strategy. So I suppose simple answer to, to, to a big question is our mobility strategy is absolutely central to how we organize our work, how we organize our workforce, how we organize our new ways of working and how, how we go about taking on the challenges of digital transformation in the most fundamental sense. Well, fantastic. Brian, there's lots to, to, to follow up on here just in terms of what a nimble, engaged workforce me, 75% external, and, and your experiences within Allied Irish Bank. And, and turning more in to your experience looking at digital transformation and wealth management, I'd like to get your sense when, when folk are, are engaging with JDX and you're engaging with folk and they're figuring out what mobility means, how much of this is actually not so much the workforce, but the customer, and, and get your sense of that with the workforce and, and what, what enterprise mobility means in wealth management, the wealth management transformation. 
Yeah. I, once again, thanks so much for, for allowing me to participate in this. It, it's a very, very relevant topic, obviously, right, with the coronavirus. Um, but I, I, I would agree with Brian. It is becoming more top of mind um, workforce strategy and mobility. Um, it, it is definitely key to the talent war um, of retaining highly skilled resources, having accessibility to additional um, skilled resources, improved productivity. Um, you know, a case can be made that 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 it absolutely increases time to market. And then another area that I, I'm actually trying to fascinating, and I know it might sound a little off topic, but ESG, um, environmental social governance, is driving firms now to focus on being more transparent on their business practices to serve a greater social purpose. It's prompted by the millennial generation holding uh, firms accountable for their actions. So you will see as, as part of ESG and carbon emissions that Firms are now having to, to, to proactively publish their corporate travel um, and how much of that affects carbon emissions. And you say, why does that, what, what does that have to do with mobility? It, it has everything to do with mobility because being able to have a mobile enterprise to reduce corporate travel and be able to have an infrastructure that is secure, that you can work and behave and not have to travel to business meetings. Um, and enabling that culture. And that is definitely, I find, in the financial services industry, ESG is a, a large component trend, and it is driving the way we do business down to um, mobility architecture. And and I think that leads nicely into, to, to Karen, you know, your role at CWSI, helping folk design their strategies design how they're going to implement and tackle these problems. So Brian talked on control and um, agility as being key, balancing things that they're balancing. Nate Maureen touched on the cultural impact, ESG, a millennial workforce. So, so when you're sitting down, maybe for audience, maybe just to kind of describe for them, what is an enterprise mobility strategy? And when you're sitting and designing on the key priority areas for a firm and a strategy, what are the top three things in their list, Corp, Karen? Yeah, so I suppose the key thing really uh, with the strategy is taking time out to think about exactly what your, your objectives are. What is it that you're trying to achieve, right? Um, because at the end of the day, it's all about enabling users to do their job as efficiently as possible, unleashing the power that sits within these mobile devices. And the technology is there to enable this, but the key is really, you know, successful planning, successful mapping of your, your business objectives to your consumers and your end users. And a lot of that really comes into what the implementation looks like. And, and what that is like in essence is taking your business requirements into implementation design. We need security controls in place without hindering the user experience. And I think that kind of speaks to Brian's point in regards to getting that balance right between control and agility. That's something that would be a common denominator that I would um, have discussions with on a weekly basis uh, with, with other enterprise clients. And the key with this really is not hindering the user experience. Because sure. there, there's a lot of security controls there, um, but, but it's getting that balance right because if you implement the deprecate the user experience and then you know it's counterproductive to what you're doing really in terms of your enterprise mobility strategy and also it's, sorry it's, please over to you Karen it's much more than just protecting at a divide level really um, and it's very much now about broadening it out and going back into identity ultimately you know trying to adopt well, what we talk about a lot now, a zero trust model, where every request to access data is verified with a minimum of impact to end users. So for example, um, multi-factor authentication or biometrics, to be fair, biometrics isn't something that we're really seeing today, but it's definitely something we would anticipate that we will see a lot more of in, you know, as the year goes out. Every industry then will also have its own set 
internal and external characteristics. So will influence firstly the strategy, but then by nature the implementation from a compliance requirement point of view to legacy technologies, uh, preferred ownership types, different security postures and support capabilities on mobile devices. Different verticals can have different views on things like password policies. You know, some heavily regulated industries would have a very, I won't say draconian, but a very complex password policy, or maybe a less regulated industry, you know, is looking at going a different avenue with this. Um, again, what's your posture like in regards to BYOD or bring your own device? Is that something that sits with the culture of your organization? Again, how do you manage that controllability and agility? Or, you know, is the strategy a cope kind of corporately owned, personally enabled strategy? Um, all the way through to, you know, what's your posture like around data leakage prevention, protecting sensitive data? What, what is sensitive data for your organization? Because it will obviously be different and have a different flavor for, for different verticals. I mean, successful implementation really takes it all into consideration. And if I was to, if I was to try, and I've thought about this, right, and if I was to try to put this into one sentence, in my mind, it really essentially is a marriage of the overall strategy with the security posture, replacing the end user centric to it. Uh, because I think the one area that could cause your enterprise mobility strategy to fall over is to not actually start and look and really, really think about your end user, really, really think about why am I embarking on an enterprise mobility, mobility strategy at all? And like it really does come down to putting that power into the hands of your end user, regardless of what your overall strategy is. It, it starts with the people that are going to be consuming these devices. What are they going to be doing on the devices? How do I secure? How do I make them productive? How do I make it easy? How do I give them true satisfaction in what they're doing and positively impact their work-life balance and productivity for the organization? And, you know, quite a bit there in terms of balance. Well, yes, uh, 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 thank you very much, Karen. Quite a detailed response there and, and, and lots of us to, to tie over. And maybe I actually might flip the question to Karen, as as you touched on a lot in your response here on the successful implementation and what that might look like. So if you just flip to, to slide two, please. Perfect. And I, and I think just building on what Karen just, just overviewed there and the elements of a successful implementation. Um, Brian, look, so I, I love the way you laid out, okay, we at AIB, we looked at control, we looked at agility, we figured out that digital transformation was a kind of boil. The, we didn't want it to be a boil the ocean exercise. It had to be flexible and engaged. Now, how did you guys, you know, line up the the what the implementation is going to look like, and what kind of results you saw from that, and and why was it successful? Um. So so we are we're part we're we're only at the beginning of the next sort of wave of what we're doing. Um, so we're we're going in towards an implementation um, of which when I'm, I'm I'm talking about our digital workplace program, which is mobile and and all aspects of 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 work and how we connect to our applications across across the bank in you know, all our different guises. So where we start, where you have to start the question. I mean, Karen has just said it. The user experience. We can't be doing tech for tech's sake. We can't be building things and pushing them out and expecting people to use them without understanding uh, the user and the different cohorts of users. So it's not, you know, we can't have um, we can't have an infinite number of, of of ways of dealing with things, but we can have a certain number, and we need to know the different cohorts. So, for example, somebody in a head office has a different set of needs to somebody in a branch. There's a different set of needs to somebody in contact center. Somebody who travels a lot has a different set of needs. Somebody who, rem who works remotely. Somebody who's offshore. We have 700 people offshore. They have a different set of needs um, in terms of what they're doing. And it's not so much the people, it's what the nature of their work, who they need to connect to, what they need to get done, and how does that work? So we started off with understanding that, understanding those cohorts so that we're designing uh, for you know half a dozen or so different cohorts, 
Um, uh, and then what we've done is we've we've wrapped it into a, 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 a program of work. And I did say earlier that there's no such thing anymore as these big programs of work, but we have an overarching uh, program that hangs these things together. But then in each case, then they're quite modular uh, in what we're doing. So we want to implement in a kind of a, a light touch way. Um, and we're addressing all aspects of, of our state. So we would have 12, 13 odd thousand users. We've had a virtual desktop plus a fleet of, well, probably seven or 8,000 mobile devices. So we're looking at all of that and all of the users and all of that across what tooling do they need, what applications do they, do they need. And then there's a refresh of the infrastructure, a refresh of the operating systems, uh, and then the access to the productivity suite. Well, which bits of the productivity tooling that we now have at our disposal, uh, predominantly through Microsoft, do they need to use? Um, you know, and then you wrap security around that. And, and Karen obviously mentioned security, uh, you know, in, in a zero trust uh, way, and who needs what permission. So, I suppose we we look at it simple simple answer. We look at it from a user experience perspective. We look at it from a holistic perspective, but we're delivering probably in a in a sort of a modular, nimble way, rather than that big sort of programmatic, you know, uh, tech for tech sake type of way that we would have done so in the past, you know, a number of years ago. Thank you very much. And I'm just building on that, Brian. Just Maureen, when you're sitting down with your customers and JDX, our consultancy firm, you're designing out new solutions. I guess successive implementation, how much of this is hard numbers and ROI or productivity or protecting from audit outages or security risks? Or, you know, when they measure this piece after everything's been implemented, what are the KPIs that they're kind of tallying up to say, okay, this is hitting the mark? Yeah, absolute great question. Um, you're spot on. Um, you know, the, the first is security. Obviously, in regulation. That's front of mind. Yeah, that, that you know, all that, everything is for nothing unless you know you're audible. Um, mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Um, the piece on efficiencies and throughput. I think it comes down to once again looking, like the others had said, role-based processes, determining what functions or processes make you know, are suitable um, because, it, you know, if you don't select those right off the bat, um, you're not going to meet your ROIs. I think another big component in the ROI um, after you get your customer experience down is understanding your, your infrastructure. Um, you know, with the migration of cloud, uh, both the platforms and data to cloud, the, you know, as firms go up that maturity, cycle, they are more and more able to, to open up their systems to this type of enterprise infrastructure. I've also seen a lot of firms take a look at their legacy applications because a lot of the asset management, wealth management, and banks have a lot of legacy applications. And in order to really compartmentalize the roles and processes and not and reduce the risk, they're ensuring that a lot of their legacy applications are API enabled. And they're building kind of a layer above that that has discrete um, pieces of work and roles and are able to, to, to handle the auditability and control of that. Um, so I, I think it's measured under a couple of different lenses. You know, anything with customer experience is certainly efficiency, growth, e ease to use, time to market. Um, but that kind of all has to be wrapped into how much of your technology infrastructure needs to be refreshed or enabled to make sure data privacy, data security, um, you know, not exposing PII data when, when people, you know, personal identification data to, to people that are remote um, w without the same controls in place. So um, it, it, it's quite a bit different number of different lenses that you measure it. Great. I mean, I, I'm going to return to you in a moment, Karen, but to kind of sum up just what we just chatted through here at the moment, you know, it, this is a level of sophistication that simply been able to handle BYOD. You know, what we're saying is actually you need to kind of map out the different roles that people are going to be doing, the different app set, the different kind of data needs they've got. 
is that kind of level of sophistication required to actually make sure you've got an implementation in place that's going to hit, make, make sure folk are going to hit the ground really hard and that it's been relevant. And, and Karen, maybe, you know, we talked about what a successful one looks like. Are there any pitfalls people should be wary of or things to avoid or kind of red flags you've seen where implement, when, when kind of love has gone wrong and the implementation hasn't worked out? Why is that? I suppose the biggest pitfall that I would see is actually back at the beginning, right? And it's the lack of strategy, right? Because without the strategy, that's where you run the risk of taking a tactical or reactive approach to managing the device, which can in me, you know, which then can lead to either a security vulnerability or poor feedback from an end user. Um, I think um, that's probably one pitfall. Um, and you know, it's a common pitfall because a lot of people that have been enrolled into the role where they're responsible now uh, to manage a mobile workforce, you know, a lot of them still are people that would have transitioned from a traditional IT background. And in a lot of cases, they've inherited this. So strategy is lacking. Um, and I guess it, it's the balance of, you know, pulling back to, to design a strategy and driving forward with innovation. And I yeah, I'll think- yeah that's, a, that's a really interesting thing, actually, just to share out. And I'm going to return back to Brian. Actually, it's a really good point that a lot of firms, you know, the traditional organization and structure of how IT and infrastructure is organized, you know, telephony or mobility straddles lots of different pieces. You know, what was considered, first of all, is simply, you know, you know, getting a dial tone or something on your desk. And maybe sometimes... Mobile phones were kind of put in the same group as laptops and stuff. Brian, how did you handle that challenge within within AIB, where mobility is something that straddles application, security, data, usability? How, how, did you have someone specifically responsible for managing mobile strategy, or how did that work for you guys? Well, I suppose you you to work at these things a number at a number of different levels. You'll always have somebody who has a sort of a technical domain responsibility. Um, around these things but I think it's back to what we've kind of previously said Mm. you can't be led from that position because people people with a sort of technical domain not uh, domain bent um, you know don't necessarily see the the design objectives or the outcomes that you're trying to so you do you do need to start with your outcomes Uh, and that's why the user the user you know the user experience as we found out, is drives the customer experience. I mean, customer experience drives everything, and the user experience essentially drives the customer experience. So we have to start there, and that's where we started. So there's a second question, a lower level, a technical question about how you organize around that. And but, but if we started with the user, we started with the outcomes, we started with the work, we started with how, you know what we're trying to get done as a business, which is to transform. Uh, continually transforms because transformation is now is an initiative con- continuous thing it's not something that you begin and end it's continuous and it's iterative and it has to be a learning so that's what we're we're organizing around being able to be learning a learning culture to iterate quickly to, to deliver things to shift left so that we're very challenging our thinking and stop doing the things that don't don't be putting in tech expecting it to work um, you know, you've got to be learning as you go. So I suppose, Mike, the answer there is it's really around, you know, we've organized from the user experience and the customer experience downwards into our tech stacks. Great. Oh, look, I just maybe t- I'm going to jump off question two now, but just typically, you know, Brian, specifically for your firm, you can share just the kind of length of time it took to shape the strategy and the length of time it took to implement just as kind of maybe kind of reference points for our listeners? Um, I suppose our last sort of major mobility, and I'd say mobility stroke, uh, virtual desktop stroke remote, so it's all in the same bracket. It's we, we it's six years since we've done something of this level, and we mm. spent the last 12 months really developing the strategy and probably another couple of more months. So it's probably 12 or 18 months of strategy development. And now we're probably into two to three years of implementation to refresh um, all of our technologies. 
And so this goes to show just the seriousness of firms want to be relevant and keeping pace. This is the level of thinking that they need to do from a strategic perspective. And I guess there's lots of tactical stuff that can happen where people tactically want to patch something in for a security or problem. And I'm actually going to move on to, to question three now. We just, uh, we'll just turn to the next slide. Uh, and I think this is kind of interesting, I guess. It, it, Karen, you touched on security. We, we touched on this kind of global connected workforce. So, so maybe to share with listeners, you know, how are firms managing you know, this increased risk of a dispersed globally connected workforce? What is, you know, it just can't be saying no, you can't bring your own device or no, you can't do this. Or, no, you can't work on the move as in the interconnected global workforce we've got, work is an activity, not a place. So you know, how are firms managing this increased risk? And, and maybe to share some color with our audience, please. So just on your point there uh, around no, you're absolutely correct. You know, no, it's, it's not the buzzword. That no, it's not, no, no, it's not an answer, yeah. <laughs> it isn't. But, but what is an answer is, you know, what we have to do is remember that a lot of the time when we see behaviour like this, it is actually because users want to be more productive. So, yes, they might, uh, you might see shadow IT creeping into the organisation. You might see applications that you would have concerns about. But, but you know, nine times out of ten, the reason there is the user wants to be more productive. So rather than it being an answer of no, it really should always be a case of instead of doing what you're doing using that application, would you would you use this application because it's our corporate app? This is the secure app that we've purchased to fill the, the gap that you've identified uh, with what you're doing. But I suppose I take in the broader question really. Um, and the answer is it's really incremental steps. So like assuming a position where you have a relatively mature organization that, ha that have a strategy, that have linked their strategy to their technology, and that are really trying to stay abreast and stay on top of increased security risks, it's, it's really incremental. So it's knowing what your biggest risks are and roadmapping them really for the future, being ahead of the curve, seeing what's coming down the line. So I suppose the key most common one um, and a very topical one would be around identity and access management. This is really very much seen as the first layer. And it's, it's quite simply, you know, who has access to what, uh, when, and are they the right people to be able to access the right level of information? But what's key to that is if somebody has a requirement for priv like privileged access to something, there needs to be a route there to gain approval on it. So it's not disruptive to the end user. And again, that all ties back in, in then to your internal kind of support system there for implementation of the processes. So that's one that people very much need to keep their finger on the pulse there uh, with. Mm. Another common one would be, um, you know, the data leakage prevention, you know, protecting business sense of data. And that's really an, an, an ever growing beast in terms of what is sensitive data. How am I going to protect it? What controls am I going to use? What governance model am I going to put around it? Am I confident that my end users can all still be productive within this? And again, once you have the policy, it's very much about, you know, backing it up with your security awareness training. Because with all the technology, this is an important point, with all of the technology and all of the tools that we have to enforce the types of security controls that we want to control. It's very important that these are also backed up uh, with training and with the security awareness training. It's not all about technology. Uh, it does come in to bring it into your culture, making sure people are educated and aware around the decisions that they take when they're using an enterprise uh, device. Well, I, I would just like to step in there, as you can. So, so I, I actually... I think what became very front of newspaper us, and, and I think I'll turn to maybe more in here, was Jeff Bezos, Amazon. You know, when you see a mobile phone being hacked in that way, did you find more in your clients were getting, you know, your phone was ringing, people were saying, geez, you know, what risk we have in mobility if it can happen with the head of Amazon and it happened in that way? And just your take on the, the perceived risks around mobility and how serious folk are taking this, how serious business is taking this morning. Yeah, people, people are absolutely taking it seriously. I mean, the, the, the speed of digital transformation 
is introducing all new risks. And every firm doesn't want to be left behind in digital transformation, but it has to be done prudently. Um, you know, I'm seeing a lot more firms looking at modernizing their technical infrastructure for more self-service mobile features. Um, but with that being said, one click can kind of launch you into financial crime, cybersecurity risk. So, um, you know, you, you have to balance that. I, a lot of firms are looking at some, you know, new tools out there for real, real-time monitoring and predictive analytics to um, alert and circumvent some of the, the cyber fraud and uh, cybersecurity and fraud alerting. Um, I see a lot of firms definitely with the focus on data um, and the cross-border trading and regulations of data um, and making sure that all devices, um, you know, adhere to any sort of regulation, um, you know, global regulation, because depending on the piece of work you're working on, there's different data privacy restrictions. Um, so, you know, you, you have to get that granular, um, you know, what, when you're doing your roles and processes, it might not just be where I'm sitting, but it's the work I'm working on and where that is and what's the uh, privacy and security regulations around that. So it, it becomes much more of a complex, very overwhelming, um, daunting task. And you couple that with people, you know, are, are really trying to move ahead in their, in their customer experience, transformation journey, and it's bringing that balance together. I, I think that's a really great answer. Well, thank you very much, Maureen. And actually, just you really brought us in a nice place here. It says not just security, it's regulation, it's reputation, it's looking at things. So, and I want to return back to to, um, to Brian. Brian, I was a bit eye catching when he says seventy five percent of your workforce is external. So, when you think about this increased security, reputation, regulate regulation risk with your workforce, which is some of it's external, transient, different partners, how? What, how do you, did you manage that third party relationship with these, these folk or how is that governed and set? Do you police them? So just, just to clarify, the 75% is of our technology workforce, not the buying yes, workforce. Yes, yeah, I beg your pardon. Yes, I beg your pardon. Technology yeah. workforce. Yeah, we'll yeah, so which is, yeah, and it's a huge number. Obviously, it's a huge number. Um, and, and as you said, it's, it's, it, there's a whole, you know, it's a diverse workforce. It's a dispersed workforce. A lot of it's virtual. A lot of it's offshore, a lot of it's transient, it's flexing up and flexing down. So all of that and, and different levels of permissions doing different jobs, a lot of it to do with projects, a lot of it to do with production systems. So there's a, there's a whole there's a whole kind of gamut there that needs to be solved for. I, I think what we've kind of resolved on is that we need to take a long-term view because we think that's the long-term, the long-term will be plugging in and uh, companies, individuals, capabilities, services, APIs, which is all involving the, you know, the external world. Uh, we're not going to survive on our own. We don't want to try to survive on our own. Our success will be about how, how, how well we're able to plug in to talent and capability in different ways. So we're, from a security standpoint, we're, we're actually thinking the five to 10 year time frame right now, because what we've recognized is, um, the threats obviously are going to increase all the time. We all know that. Uh, and the surface area uh, is going to increase. So our the threat landscape, the, there's many more different ways of getting at the bank in the future um, with all the things all the, uh, we've already mentioned in terms of, you know, the dispersed workforce and working with third parties. The regulator is all, is all over this as well. Uh, you mentioned, I mentioned at the top there around controls, the EBA guidelines last year. A very strong set of guidelines came out last year, Feb, Feb 2019. It was the first time that EBA had spoken on outsourcing and third parties in 12 or 13 years. And the, the onus that they're putting, the regulators putting on regulated companies to control third parties is, is huge. Okay, and it's a complete, it's a complete change of landscape. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking that, we're taking that long-term view. So Rather than us trying to second guess what it's all going to look like, we're concentrating on who are we going to work with, which partners are we going to pick, because we really want to get the best of global emerging tech and global intelligence. 
and we don't want to be limited by what we know. So we're putting a huge amount of focus into setting up the ecosystem so that we get the best thinking at the right times. Rather than what we would have done traditionally in the last five, 10 years is spending our time evaluating the tech, looking at features and looking at trying to analyze what we're going to do. That's, a, that's, that's not a sustainable model. For us, that's not a sustainable model. We need to be able to use experts who are continuously looking at these and then collaborate effectively with them. Uh, and that's essentially what we're doing with, with security. We're taking a risk-based approach. You know, I already mentioned trust, trust is by, by design. We design trust into our systems. Uh, and then what we're doing is while we're using our ecosystem, we then need to get closer, closer to our business community, our business uh, colleagues, so that we understand the risk landscape from their perspective. So we become internal consultants. Uh, as opposed to, you know, spending our time looking at tech. We're trying to evaluate the risk and then we're trying to use our partners to get the best intelligence so that we can we can make informed decisions on a continuous basis. Um, yeah, I love that. Brian, I want to explore this just one more time for listeners too, just on this particular piece. So, you know, you're a bank. You know, some of your trading or business users will be using a mobile They'll be using a mobile that could be used that, that inadvertently maybe to conduct financial deals on, or at least uh, there has to be full transparency on and full auditing of it. So, you know, Karen mentioned earlier the cultural aspect of usage. You know, are you sitting down with your business users to explain what they can and can't do to put them in a safe situation that they're safe, your franchise is safe, their customers are safe? How, you know, how much of, of a learning and development and training and cultural bit is this point? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and it is something that we, we spend a fair bit of time on um, educating people, just letting people know the power and the danger of what's in their, of what's in their hands. So we regularly, there's regular education or, um, you know, you know, phishing, internal phishing to try to hook people in and, 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 and identify users that are not being vigilant enough. Um, you know, we work across a, a range of different measures. Um, and, and, and I think Karen already mentioned that, you know, essentially the, this all starts with identity and access management. That's the new perimeter, essentially, which is who has access to what. Uh, and, it's, uh, and, you know, that's our starting point. And it's really then around, uh, as, you've, as, you've, as you've addressed in your question, it's an education. It's an education for people across the enterprise. Hmm. Fabulous. Well, I think, folks, I'd like to turn to, to question four. And this is here now. We've got our strategy in place. We've done a successful implementation. Everyone's trained up and tooled up. It's all great. But now when you think of, of that as, you know, and you've spent 18 months designing the strategy, a couple of years implementing it, how much of this investment is part of your, it says recruitment term intention strategy here, but, you know, how much that, is really seeing attracting new folk to join your firm. You know, how much of this mobile piece is part of that um, uh, badge of honor that you'll say, look, when you come and work with us, this is how, this is how, this is how you can work with us. This, this is what we mean. And I think I'd like to start, um, I'm going to start with, with Maureen, if I may, just, you know, how much a mobile first sex strategy impacts, you know, the ability to attract and retain top talent. Yeah, uh, so one of the unique positions than the other panelists, um, you know, we're a consulting firm, so a large part of our um, work that the consulting team does is really at client sites. So we pretty much follow the lead of our clients, on, um, but most of the time we are on site. Um, however, with that being said, with the coronavirus, we're getting more and more requests um to, to be able to work remotely um but once again that is at the behest of our clients and also we we follow their um policies and procedures as far as that but from a pure jdx perspective i i, I think from a retention policy it, you know the the millennial generation is you know the the the, the trend um to to really adopt this we we are seeing access to more talent across the globe. Um, once you have a very strong strategy, as in you, you are covered from the security 
perspective and, and are able to kind of, from a regulation perspective, have people work on the right discrete amount uh, processes and work products. It, it allows us to expand our recruitment strategy well beyond, you know, the the, the walls of the our, our JDS process. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I'm going to ask um, uh, Brian the same question, but I'm maybe going to re- 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 you know, take out the word mobile tech. Just listen to Maureen's answer. There. So, and so is uh, modern, best practice, flexible, agile work practices part of your recruitment and retention strategy? It almost seems like a rhetorical question, doesn't it? But but is when you're defining the strategy, were you kind of doing the, the future of the workforce kind of work, Brian, and mapping this out? How did it look? And what parts of this kind of attention work feed into that strategy? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't think there's a bigger question to, than in business um, in this in this in this area than how do you um, how do you attract, retain? How do you ensure that you have a sustainable pipeline of talent? available to you our access to the skills the people and the skills the capabilities wherever you find them and you know through through apis or services or 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 individuals and 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 really what this comes down to is you know it's what people will ask and companies will ask they'll, they'll i think they'll become more fussy all the time what are, what's the opportunity for us what are the conditions on which we're working how easy it is it to work with you what kind of what way have you set up yourself to to work? So you talk, you mentioned agile, agile methodologies. There is no other game in town. You have to be committed to agile. The, there are, there isn't another option. I haven't heard anybody give any. Uh, and if you're not committed, and and what I mean committed is, you're, it's the culture, it's the tooling, it's the devices, it's the ways of working, and. Um, it's giving people the opportunities to influence your thinking, your strategy, to allow them the room to have to be critical thinkers, to go, I wouldn't challenge, I wouldn't do that, I would, I would do it this way, or I wouldn't do that at all. I don't think there's enough value in that. And these are the things that people are looking for as you're trying to hire, not just hire, but 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 bring people into your ecosystem. Uh, they they should be more demanding of you. So you know, it, this is a huge question. It's it's a much bigger question than mobile tech, but mobile right. technologies and mobility is central to this question. And honestly, I don't think there's a bigger question for us to all answer. And we're massively exercised about it right now. No, a fantastic answer. And I kind of tease, tease off Karen, I'd like to return to you. So again, if we kind of removed it, I can talk about a modern, flexible, agile work practice and culture, part of your recruitment or retention strategy. Karen, from your experience working across your, your 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 customers, how much of them come for security and data as the first one, first priority? But then when you sit down and you paint out to them, actually, this is how you're going to compete against you know the behemoths or the Amazons or the Googles or the fintechs or the kind of I'm going to say I'm not going to say cooler firms, but I'm going to say maybe more digital native firms that that kind of are switched on to this. So, so how much of that forms part of the response you're giving back to these, Karen, and some colour in that to our audience would be great. Yeah, so I think it, it comes down to really um, who you're talking to within the enterprise. So if you're talking to the IT department, um, you know, their mandate is going to be what has been dictated from the security department. I think when we do, when we get into our consulting engagements around strategy, around your modern workplace assessment, your mobile maturity assessment, that's where we bring in the wider business stakeholders. And that's where you see really um, the, the key drivers here um, and definitely the, how would I say it? Like when we talk about, you know, mobile technology or this new modern working, really what it is, it's, it's, it's less about technology. It's more about empowering a lifestyle now. Right. But empowering a lifestyle that's intangent and that's, you know, there is a correlation to with the business that you're working for. So the business is achieving business goals it wants to achieve. It's standing out with its, with its end customers. It's delivering an excellent experience to its employees. The employees are living the dream, really, because of the flexibility and all of the benefits that I won't go on about. 
that this technology and this new way of working brings. Like it, it is absolutely probably the greatest example of a win-win where you see all of these constellations joining to create the perfect kind of the perfect dream really where you have your users are productive, they're happy, they have shorter commutes, they have flexibility, they're not coming into crowded offices unless there's an absolute need to be in crowded offices. Mm. Delivering a better experience to whether they're dealing with your external clients or internal clients. Your security people are happy because they know that while these guys are off doing everything great that they need to be doing, they're doing it in a way that everybody can sleep at night and worry not about losing enterprise data or about mobile threat defense or phishing or any vulnerabilities that might try and attack this new perimeter. And then you have all of that to think, you know, ideally up to the vision and the strategy really of the organization. And that is what the optimum looks like here. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I, I, you, you often see, yeah, you often see the photographs on LinkedIn where companies proudly uh, have their kind of onboarding welcome pack on someone's desk, which is the mobile and 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 and, and the, kind of the whole piece and ready to go, and they're out being kind of road warriors or working from home or working remotely. Oh, excellent, very good. We've come to the last question. So, question five, please. Uh, now, look, we've we've done a we've done a tour of setting the strategy, looking at the implementation, thinking how how risk can drive us here, and what that meant for the extended workforce and for the extended organization. Then we kind of did a round robin on recruitment and retention strategy, and in fact, it wasn't so much about smart tech; it was kind of modern work practices. So, I guess I, I'd like to to um, close off with this final question, which. which Brian, why don't you begin? You know, how can businesses take the smart advantage? How can they capitalize on mobile? So just a few moments of your thoughts or where a business may be listening in today you can say, where do I start with this? How can it take advantage of this and what will it mean for their business? Um, so, Mike, I suppose, you, again, just to take the, the word mobile, we, we, when we think about mobile in AIB, we're, we're thinking primarily about two, two different things. So one is what we've largely been speaking about on this call, which is the enablement of the work place and work and people and, and and giving them access the right people right access to things that's one aspect of it which is very much around our infrastructure and uh, our capabilities our tooling and our security but there's a second aspect and i just want to sort of bring it into the conversation here because we we look at mobile as a, a channel uh, mm -hmm. and the most probably the most important channel to the bank so when we when we organize our technology, we do down a, a stack. We have a stack of our technology, and we have it starts with our our systems of engagement. So how do how do our customers touch us? And 1.6 million of our customers touch us through our mobile app. And um, we've we've got a pretty good mobile app. It's it's well it's it's been well has been very well received over the last number of years, and we tend to be relatively quick in in, in new releases and, and bringing. Um, bringing um, innovation to bear on the channel. So, you know, so our, our first point, the first point of contact with the bank, how do you get to do anything with the bank is through your systems engagement and mobile being the sort of one of the primary. Um, and then you've got obviously that underneath that sits our, you know, our systems of integration. How do, how do our processes work and our systems of insight? How do, you know, how do we use data? How do we keep our data safe? And how do we use our data within our processes? And then all the way down into the core stack of, of how you do things, payments or core banking or treasury, all the different kind of main um, applications that that run the bank, and then down into the infrastructure. So I suppose there's two there's two aspects to that from our point of view. Um, so I think we've I think we've probably gone I've probably said enough about it in terms of what we're doing about the workforce in terms of mm -hmm. mobile as a channel. This year we're 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 looking at a major refresh in uh, in our mobile app. Um, as as we all know, it's table stakes. If you don't have a very strong mobile app and you're not able to compete and you're not able to innovate quickly, you know you're 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 dying. You're dying slowly or dying quickly, as as the case may be. And so, you know, I, 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 when you talk about mobile, there's probably not a there's probably not a more important word in the bank than you know, uh, you know how are we how are we developing our the bank in a sustainable way, um, you know, with mobile. There's then it just just to take this to, to sort of to complete the point, um, 
AIB, the brand in AI, uh, of AIB is about being at the center of our customers' financial lives. And really, that, that is through the mobile. And also, our mantra in the bank, if you've probably seen recently, is sustainability. We really got hard on going after the sustainability of the agenda. So, you know, you know, the impact that you can have on the environment by being, by being mobile and not forcing, you know, people into, as Karen has already said, into crowded offices and all that. So there's a, there's a huge impact that mobile in the most general sense can have on, you know, on the, on the bank, the brand and our sustainability agenda into the future. Well, well, speak. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, it was a really great answer. And speaking as one one of those 1.6 million happy users, I love your app. By the way, I, I absolutely think it's fantastic. I the IB app, and I'm a keen user of it. Maureen. So, from wealth management, I think there's a huge amount happening here between mobility and financial services, between advisors and customers in the UX. There's a ton of stuff happening here. Do you just want to touch on just briefly before we wrap up and run out of time? How busy can take smart of the um, advantage in 2020 and capitalize on this technology and cultural shift? Maybe. Yeah, and I'll kind of take that with um, an example. You know, I, I recently worked on uh, a client um, strategy. The, the client uh, is a large asset wealth manager. Right now, they're in the Gartner's top four turn on customer experience. Um, they are in a location that is hard to find talent. So mobility and customer experience is at the heart of what they do. Um, you know, funny enough, what we're, where we kind of landed on is they wanted to have some of their their phone reps, which is a grueling job. They're, they're the contact center, a very grueling job with a lot of turnover to retain that talent. Um, that what they landed on was um, a, a full omni-channel experience experience, um, contact center, cloud-based, that with the right cues that offered text and video um, from the investors to the at-home person, believe it or not, um, it's through, and controlling that through cues on the contact center and, and getting back to the right discrete amount of you know, work product that didn't have PII data, so they could still leverage the, the, the resources. They were able to do chat through the mobility with the investors, as well as even dual browsing on their phone to that phone because customer experience was very important. Um, so there's a lot of really good technology out there. A lot of firms are, are you know, in their maturity. Some are adopting it quicker to, than others. But what I would say is probably this isn't just and client customer experience, you can really take what you give to the end client and with the right infrastructure, you can adopt this in your workforce. Um, and they're, they're seeing great, great throughput in um, retention of their operational services, which is in a very difficult area to skill up talent um, and, and still give the same customer experience, if not better, that they have today. Thank you very much, Maureen. I think, quite fittingly, the last word should go to Karen. In about 90 seconds, Karen, could you sum up how business can take a smart advantage in 2020 from a CWSI perspective? And what would you recommend? Yeah, I, I'll try and do it in 60 seconds. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> quite simply, adoption. I think adoption is, is the key here to success. You know, depending on the culture and the trust factors, physical office space could be reduced, which in turn would reduce facility overheads either by adopting a full or even a hybrid remote working policy. Commute times could be eliminated, driving a serious increase in productivity satisfaction, rationalizing the broader infrastructure to adopt true mobile first, like remove traditional desk phones, consolidate volume of devices by looking at user persona, making sure the right user has the right type of device, removing paper-based processes, and really looking at a deeper integration with line of business applications to speed up decision making fueled by having accessibility to more data driven rich analytics, leveraging more automation, AI, and really empowering somebody to make a decision on the spot on a mobile device. Uh, I think, you know, adoption will, will really only come with understanding and education and breaking down the fear or the resistance that might be out there. 
Uh, but yeah, in very simple terms, in 59 seconds, I think adoption. Well, Oh, perfect. Thank you. So if we just jump to the last slide, please, I just want to say many thanks to our panel, to um, Karen, to Maureen and to Brian for sharing your insights. Really fantastic. I can't believe the hours slipped by this quickly. And many thanks to CDWSI for bringing this event to market. To find out more about CDWSI and the service we provide, please visit cwsisecurity.com. You can have a look at everyone's um, contacts and digit details on the screen here. Their inbox are always open. Please reach out to them if you'd like to, any more information. Uh, a copy of today's slides will be available too, and we're making a recording, which we'll publish in due course. But just to say thank you very much, folks. I really enjoyed that. Uh, a great talk and a great discussion. And just uh, thank you very much, dear listener, for tuning in.